My name is Alexander Shatarin. I'm working at JetBrains in MPS team. And today, uh, the title of my presentation is uh, Biological Knowledge Base and uh, WebMPS Projects and Status of Update on top of it. Uh, so Biological Knowledge Base stands for a repository of the structured uh, biological information with a smart query ability on top of it. We uh, started this project in the year 2018. And uh, that moment, we created a regional set of DSLs within the MPS and uh, distributed that as an MPS-based RCP application. This prototype was uh, shown to a selected group of people. We received quite positive feedback about that. Everyone said that they would like to have a project like this. But uh, everyone actually said that they want to have something more lightweight to not download the application and to have it running in the browser. So next year, we spent uh, rewriting our project to uh, the browser. That moment, we were using MPS plugin for IntelliJ IDEO for DSL development. Uh, we were targeting WebMPS library, uh, also known as JetPad library, which was developed at JetBrains a little bit before that moment. Uh, the, uh, the feature of that library was that we were using JWT technology in order to get uh, JavaScript out of the Java if it is necessary. The code generation target was Java at that moment. And in the same year, we started integration with the GeneStack platform. GeneStack is our partner company. We're developing that project together with GeneStack. And the idea was to use GeneStack platform to promote uh, the project. Uh, in the year 2020, we realized that uh, there is quite uh, reliable and uh, interesting technology. Uh, Kotlin multi-platform and especially Kotlin JS uh, developed within the JetBrains. And in the same time, JWT uh, technology has a not very clear future. So we decided that it's probably a good time to, uh, to go out of the JWT and Java uh, toward the Kotlin. Uh, so we were uh, busy rewriting M M WebMPS uh, library to a Kotlin together with all DSL uh, definitions we were using in, in that library. Uh, in the same time, we were developing document versioning model. Document is uh, something like a root node in, uh, in terms of our project. And uh, actually, we were migrating out of the GeneStack platform to a set of microservices uh, running separately in AWS. Currently, we have a very small uh, layer of dependency on top of uh, uh, dependency on the GeneStack. Uh, this is uh, mostly about the UI. Um, in the next year, uh, we were actually importing um, biological data from various sources and integrating them all together in a, uh, our knowledge base project. And uh, in the same time, we decided to implement uh, edit a service. This is an interesting component. It should be uh, represented or should be understood as a server side peer for an editor opened within the browser. Uh, the reason for this component is very simple. We have to deal with uh, a large documents, ontology, element, uh, ontology libraries in the scope of that project. And we have to provide a smart completion on top of such documents. And we simply cannot afford loading that type of documents each time to the uh, browser, uh, into the browser on the client side. Um, so in the end of that year, uh, 2021, there was a last uh, demo of uh, our project on the MPS online event. And since I promised you to provide uh, an update, I'll primarily talk about the period of time after that moment. Uh, so last year, we were actually um, improving perf performance uh, of uh, different uh, services in the scope of our project by, generally speaking, introducing various indexes and caches and saving them in the database on the server side. And an uh, important milestone of the last year was that we have started an early access program for a limited group of domain experts. Um, it's, uh, it's really important. We are really happy that we did that. And one more thing about the last year I want to highlight is actually uh, our efforts uh, in implementing in improving a query engine and uh, query results uh, graph view presentation within the scope of our project. This year, uh, we... Uh, we are actually implementing feature requests, which are, were reported by uh, our early access uh, program and early access users. And in the same time, we decided that we should probably make edit a service, which is used inside the project, more generic and usable for uh, any 
other type of such projects. In other words, let's uh, say that we decided to put it into the uh, WebMPS part and make all these caches more or less uh, generic. So first of all, uh, I'd like to highlight that during the whole lifetime, uh, lifetime of our project, we were simultaneously working on two different directions. One direction is actually the knowledge base itself, and another direction is a WebMPS, an underlying technology. And uh, let me first uh, say a few words about the knowledge base uh, project. On this uh, screenshot, you can see uh, an editor which was opened in the browser with a document. This document was created by uh, actual early access uh, program users. Uh, user, um, I'm not going to show you any demo of that project. If you are interested in the details of this project, the knowledge base itself, there was a quite good presentation on MPS Talk Series 2021 on our last online event. This is the title, link, QR code. Uh, copy it, watch later, please. Let's not spend time on it. A uh, few words about the development process within the um, knowledge base uh, project. We have a continuous integration on the team city. We have feature branches, obviously. We're developing everything in the feature branches. Each feature branch may be expanded on, onto the cloud in, in, in AWS in order to try it and debug it if you want. Once the functionality is merged back to the master, uh, it may be propagated to the staging or development server uh, where we can uh, check if everything works together, the integration of different functionalities, different subsystems, and if everything is fine, we propagate the same build to the production server. Early access users are uh, using production server for their uh, attempt to edit in documents. Uh, and um, yeah, we are trying to make releases as, as, uh, as frequent as we can, generally speaking. Uh, once per two weeks, once per week, we release something on the uh, production server. Um, we have a limited group of domain experts really working with our uh, product, and we have a dedicated group of developers working closely with them. The idea is that uh, developers would actually help domain experts to realize what they need, the requirements, and uh, later either uh, implement corresponding improvements inside the DSL, uh, set, uh, which is, I would say, quite a big amount of work right now, or uh, formulate possible feature requests for uh, an underlying web MPS technology and make it a uh, more general requirement. Uh, generally speaking, the life cycle has to look like that. We first uh, uh, get the feature request, then we try to implement it specifically for the knowledge base project, when we try to uh, think if it is generic enough or not, and if the functionality is general, we would like to uh, to integrate it into the WebMPS project. Uh, generally speaking, the same uh, life cycle has to be applied for any other projects. We are trying to grab uh, requirements for from any other potential customers of the WebMPS technology, and the goal is actually to make WebMPS suitable for any type of such use cases and release it finally as a platform or as a standalone product. Uh, so let me switch to the WebMPS platform and say a few words about the current state, state and our future directions of the development. So we say that WebMPS platform is a, a cloud-based platform as a service solution. This means that uh, we'd like to have it running in AWS cloud and uh, language developers may host their language, uh, their DSL implementations in, in that instance of the uh, platform. Uh, in the same time, we have to support um, a different way of installation of the, the WebMPS platform because some of our uh, customers or potential customers are uh, very uh, sensible from the side of the you know security and data, and they would like to save everything within the local network under firewalls. So we have to support on-premises instance uh, installation for this uh, type of the platform. An SDK for language developers is an important aspect of, of the platform. Uh, it is Kotlin-based, uh, so you just uh, write your language definition within uh, the IntelliJ IDEA in Kotlin code. It should be possible to run uh, an instance of, uh, of con corresponding editor and uh, platform locally within the Docker or as a Java process in order to test it and debug it. And uh, there should be a smooth deployment story supported um, by the uh, SDK. So let me switch to the uh, architecture of the platform and talk about that a little bit. This is the slide from our last presentation, by the way. On the top of the slide, you can see the user working with the browser. A browser contains an instance of the projectional editor, 
editing um, a document or a root node in terms of MPS within the memory of that process. Any changes um, the user made in the browser uh, actually have to be synchronized with the underlying operation transformation service. This is our central place for synchronizing changes coming out of different uh, editing uh, sessions from different users. And it actually provides us uh, with the concurrent editing uh, functionality out of the box. Um, on the left side of the slide, you can see an editor service. This is the service I was talking about uh, previously. And the, 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 the idea of this service is that uh, it has to load any, or better say, all the documents from the operational transformation server and keep complete in memory snapshot of all the models within the repository in order to let a corresponding um, projection editor component running within this, the same process to traverse the data and uh, use it for uh, serving editing uh, requests coming out of the user. For example, if user press control space, corresponding requests have to uh, be issued from the editor to the editor service, then um, the completion provider component actually traverses them in memory snapshot of the models, collects all the necessary information, uh, wrap it into the data transfer object and pull it back to the, to the editor. Uh, this is how it uh, was intended to work, but uh, actually there is a problem with this kind of architecture. It is not very uh, good from the perspective of uh, performance and scalability. Let me say a few words about that. Uh, an editor service have to keep a huge um, piece of information inside the memory, the whole uh, snapshot of the model repository, which is uh, quite uh, memory consuming. And uh, in the same time, the editor service was designed to serve several requests coming uh, out of the serial editing sessions from different users. So uh, there's a chance that in parallel, there may be several requests uh, going to the editor service. So several instances of the completion provider would traverse the same snapshot inside the memory. And uh, the traversal process is not uh, very straightforward, so it may be complex. And it, it, as a result, it would uh, load the CPU in, in accordance. Uh, definitely, this problem may be solved by uh, running more instances of the editor service, but this is probably far from the ideal uh, presentation or ideal, um, uh, yeah, ideal picture of uh, the architecture we would like to have. So, on this uh, screenshot or on this slide, you can see uh, a different architecture which we are working on right now. The top part of the slide stays unchanged, but um, there is additional analyzer service introduced on the bottom part. The idea of this service is that it is listening for a notifications about any changes from the operational transformation service. At the moment, it realizes that something was changed. Corresponding single document have to be loaded into the memory of the analyzer server. So we are working in a scope of single root in terms of MPS. The analyzer or better say, analyzers, can be executed on top of that document in order to collect all the necessary information. Collected results have to be saved in the underlying database. And that's it. Uh, if the analyzer will request any additional information from a different root of the node, it should access it through the database as a result uh, of another analyzer execution. So the idea is that we build a chain of analyzers with the dependencies and run them uh, sequentially on uh, a limited set of data and saving everything into the underlying database. Uh, the underlying database on this picture is graph database. Uh, first, it looks quite natural to use graph database for saving uh, pieces of models with a uh, corresponding dependency graph. And on the other side, uh, we want to use uh, non-trivial um, recursive queries, which can be quite complex to, 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 to implement with the uh, standard SQL-like database. So we decided to try GraphDB. Uh, as a current uh, solution, we are choosing Neo4j, but this is this is questionable. Um, few words about uh, editor service. Uh, in this case, it starts being very, very lightweight because if the request is going out of the editor to the editor service, it is a uh, very simple corresponding uh, component completion provider will just offload all the calculation by issuing a complex query to the underlying graph DB, which uh, actually would uh, collect it uh, and uh, pull the results back. And again, the results would be wrapped into the data transfer objects and uh, sent to the client. So it seems to be a little bit more lightweight than the previous 
uh, previous picture. Um, at some point, users may de decide that the, the snapshot of the uh, documents they were editing is uh, good enough and they would like to publish a new uh, global version of the knowledge base for the whole world to be, av uh, to, to be available for uh, other users, for uh, viewers. Um, at this point, actually, uh, what we should do is uh, to get a snapshot of the models from the Operation Transformation Service and fix it. In this picture, uh, there is a document repository where we uh, load it. The content of such documents will be never change, uh, changed in the, uh, in the future. So uh, it is fixed forever. And in the same time, uh, we already have all pre-calculated uh, analyzer results saved for this set of snapshots of the documents within the GraphDB. So all we have to do is just to take corresponding snapshot and keep it for future. And in this case, if user is opening the browser with the editor inside it, the editor or better read-only editor or better a viewer will uh, send corresponding uh, requests, like for example, a resolve reference request to the editor service. And then the, the same process is uh, generally speaking executed. Um, let me say a few words about the publishing process. Um, I strongly, strongly believe that this is a quite central place for any type of uh, such, uh, such software. I mean, software which uses projectional editor in the browser. So um, actually the real output of the editing session is not uh, a live document saved on the operational transformation service. The idea is that at some point users have to publish the content of their models. This means that uh, the snapshot have to be offloaded to the publishing process, which generally speaking may run additional uh, validations or unit testing if you want on top of the models. And then uh, a set of artifacts have to be produced out of these models. At this point, I think that the artifacts are starts being most important output of the editing process. This means that um, if you edit some document on some real server, the result have to be an application running on the mobile phone or uh, a kind of workflow executed within the server scope or something else. So uh, generally speaking, the artifact may be an entry in the database, uh, XML, JSON, JavaScript, or any other kind of source code. Uh, and that's it. Uh, it. It would be actually uh, used by the system. And uh, in the same time, the model content is not uh, very important after this point. It may be used by uh, original editors in order to see what piece of information was or which uh, kind of model was actually used to produce this type of the artifact or maybe create uh, additional next version of the software in the future. Uh, this, is, uh, this is very similar to what we have in MPS. So if you edit a document in the MPS, at some point you decide that you are happy with the content. So you generate the code, compile it, jar it, and then use the jar somewhere outside of the process. Uh, you can put model content nearby, but this is not very necessary. Um, it looks like we don't have such an artifacts in the knowledge base project, but that's not true because uh, except of the documents we are editing and publishing during the knowledge base project uh, lifecycle, we um, actually have to run uh, a queries on top of the knowledge graph. So the query engine have to be efficient. So the idea is that the query engine is using already some query engine index database for traversing the knowledge graph. This means finding starting possible uh, nodes within the graph, ending nodes, and connection, connections between them. So uh, if the user actually type a query and run it, uh, query engine will go directly to the query engine index, load corresponding data, use it for constructing the paths, and then uh, actual documents will be used uh, only at the moment the user actually click on the corresponding node in the graph and would like to see the content. So the, the document content is not very important for query engine logic. Let me switch to the SDK aspect of uh, our platform. So on this uh, screenshot, you can see an example of three analyzer rules. First uh, rule is uh, actually a scoping rule, producing a, a, a collection scope of ontology elements out of the 
uh, ontology library. Ontology library is a document or a root node in terms of our system, and this is classical uh, collection scoping rule, which probably uh, is common for any, any type of uh, software like that. Uh, so the second uh, rule on the screenshot is a default scoping rule, which is executed on the global context, or module, how we call it, uh, which actually consists of the set of root nodes. Uh, the module is a library module in this uh, example, and it actually produces a number of ontology libraries out of it. And the last uh, rule is uh, a naming rule, which produces some naming information for each ontology element. Interesting uh, aspect of, of this uh, screenshot is that uh, the last uh, analyzer, the last, the last rule, is actually running on top of the ontology elements, which was created by the first one. So this is kind of dependent rules uh, or example of dependent rules. Uh, I was uh, talking about analyzers because they are expected to be executed on the server. And before that moment, we were talking about the server. Let's switch a little bit to the client aspect. So at the moment, we uh, changed MPS uh, by the Kotlin and internal DSLs. We actually lost a generator. And the generator is quite important aspect, I would say, and interesting aspect, because it helps us to hide any implementation details from the, uh, from the end user defining the language. Uh, so at the moment we moved to the Kotlin, uh, we had to open our internal uh, internal API of our library and uh, let user uh, code uh, implementations for their concepts. So users have to, generally speaking, understand uh, internal patterns like, uh, you know, operational transformation specific API, which have to be used by the implementation, or uh, maybe some, you know, way of handling multiple inheritance because we're using interfaces for uh, defining concepts and they support multiple inheritance, but classes cannot extend several classes in the same time. So we decided to, uh, to try Kotlin annotations and compile a plugin for this type of, uh, to substitute actually this uh, technology in the Kotlin stack. And uh, you see that we're using add concept annotation in order to, uh, to switch or trigger a compiler plugin and let it generate implementations of our concepts automatically. In addition to that, there are two, two more examples of the Kotlin annotations, a module, uh, which actually is a definition of this global context or library module uh, uh, interface, and a language which is uh, an entry point object for, uh, for a language definition in our system. Uh, the next slide is actually about using uh, the code which was generated by the, uh, by the compiler plugin. Actually, if we hide an implementation of the concepts, it's not possible to instantiate it anymore. So in the middle part of the screenshot, uh, you can see an example of cotton builders, which are using extension methods like ontology library elements or ontology element, which are actually building a, a model. And all these methods are uh, uh, are not, uh, not, not true. So this means that if you press control B, on such method, you end up somewhere close to the concept interface definition. So it's not possible to find a declaration of this method and implementation. It was generated by the compiler plugin and uh, still available in the ID by, you know, for for uh, for an end user. This is the same uh, way we, I mean, we are using uh, Kotlin compiler plugin in the same way as, uh, for example. A Kotlin serialization or any other frameworks are using that. So we generate these synthetic methods and let it uh, be used by the end user. Few words about the editor. Uh, we are not happy with the current syntax of the editor as well. Uh, this means that as well as uh, with the manually typing implementations for the concepts. And we are playing with different, uh, different uh, ways of defining the editor. For example, on this screenshot, there is an example of Jetpack Compose editor which looks uh, very uh, similar to, uh, to um, what you have in MPS actually. So there is a declarative set of uh, collections and, uh, and cells which, uh, which describes the editor. Uh, one thing about the um, current state of the editor, we support only text-like projectional editing. So we don't support any rich uh, notations yet. We would like to do it in the future. And I'm not sure that we will use Jetpack Compose. This is just one of our options, but we will definitely stick with some declarative syntax like you can see on the screen. 
let's talk about building and deploying uh, the, the language declaration. Uh, actually, if we introduce the Kotlin compiler plugin, at this point, it should be included into any building process of our project. So it, it has to be downloaded from somewhere and used for a compilation. And this, the natural way to do it is to uh, do it via Gradle and implement corresponding Gradle plugin. So uh, you have seen similar code already in the presentation of Sasha, actually. <laughs> so uh, this is a, a custom Gradle plugin uh, defining the language with corresponding ID and number of language aspects for structure, uh, analyzers, and editor. Uh, each aspect, uh, we would like to keep them separately with uh, a separate set of dependencies in order to to not populate any UI-specific dependencies onto the server and vice versa. And uh, this slide is actually an example of the project structure, which was derived from the uh, con corresponding Gradle plugin within the IntelliJ IDEA project. This is a sub-project BioKBLang with different uh, source routes for uh, structure, analyzer, editor, editor test. And there are two other sub-projects, for, one for web application and another for IntelliJ IDEA, if you would support it and if you will to de declare it. So I think I'm going to the very last slide of my presentation. We need more power to drive all these technologies forward. So we are hiring in both projects, MPS and WebMPS. We have various locations, Czech Republic, Germany, Cyprus, Serbia, Netherlands, and others. Thank you very much for your attention. It's time for questions. Questions? Uh, what's the idea about the Will, uh, will this be open source or what's the idea of using this for ourselves? Mm, this is a good question. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's unclear what, what I can say else, right? Because we don't have uh, the complete uh, you know, source code and project developed till the very end. But uh, I mean, uh, let's put it this way. This way. There are two questions. Uh, will it be open source and will it be commercial? It will be definitely commercial for commercial products, right? So we have to uh, have to sell some licenses for it. And what about the open source? SDK will be definitely open sourced, right? So you can grab it, use it, because otherwise language developers will not be able to work with that. And yeah, the the, the server is probably a matter of special license, and I'm not sure that it will be open sourced, but there is a chance, yeah. or server components, better say. Yeah. And currently, it is not open source. If th that was the question. <laughs> I have two questions. So you mentioned that the database can be very big. Do, do you have a yeah, order of magnitude? How big is it? Uh, I was talking about ontologies. On, OK. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, we measure it in megabytes. And it was a JSON storage, but it is a couple of gigabytes. Okay. And so we, we, if, we, if we stick to the JSON nodes. persist, sorry? 10 million nodes. 50 million nodes. It's not millions, it's probably hundred thousands or something like that, yeah. But this is, you know, uh, ontology, uh, the specific of the ontology document document is that uh, it is very flat. So this means that if you press control space, you have to show hundred thousands of completion items. <laughs> and do you have um, in plan to support any kind of evolution of the language so in the sense of language evolution with the needs of domain expert and things like this? Or? Definitely we should, since we have it in MPS to some extent, we, we want to have something better. <laughs> and uh, I'm not sure how exactly right now. Any more questions? Then I would free the space. Thank you very much.